18. Beginning at verse 1, Jeremiah, the Old Testament prophet, chapter 18, beginning at verse 1. And I would ask us again tonight if we would all stand simply in honor of the reading of God's Word. Amen. Jeremiah 18, beginning at verse 1. And the word of the Lord reads in this fashion. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. I want to deliver tonight a simple word of exhortation entitled, A Work in Progress. Amen. A Work in Progress. Would you pray with me? Master, we love you tonight, and we thank you, God, for this wonderful, wonderful anointing that we already feel in this place tonight. And we thank you for the miracles that you're sending to Sister Connie, who is our new friend and new acquaintance. And Lord, we're looking forward anxiously to the a praise report of great things that you've done. As your word is about to go forth, my God, we pray that your prophetic anointing would rest upon your servant. God, that you'd anoint me today from top to bottom. Lord, that I might deliver every word that you have placed in my spirit for this people, for this hour, for this time, that everyone that hears this message in this place and by cassette tape will be blessed and helped, encouraged, enlightened, and led into a greater place in God than they've ever before been. Master, grant it tonight, for we ask it in the wonderful, lovely, glorious name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. Amen. Many Christians today approach their lives and their walks with the Lord uh, as if this life were genuinely all we had. While it's true that we occupy this realm of humanity for a season, the truth is that our existence here is but a time of preparation for the things to come which God has promised and prepared through His Son, the man Jesus Christ. Just as important to any operation or surgery is the preparation. If the patient is not properly prepped, the potential for disaster in the operating room is increased many, many times over. Did you hear that now? Just as important to the actual surgery is the preparation for the surgery. You see, the surgeon's hands may be more skilled. He may be able to do uh, things that we, the, the average layman is not able to do. But that little nurse who goes in and cleans up and shaves and puts on the antibiotics and prepares the area where the surgery is going to be performed, her job is every bit as important as the surgeon's. The preparation is as important as the actual surgery. Why? Because if the preparation isn't done right, what's going to happen when the surgery is performed? Well, now you've increased the risk of infection. Right? Now you've increased the risk for things to go wrong. So even though they may survive the surgery, they may wind up dying because of something that happened because the preparation wasn't done right. Amen. And a lot of Christian folks don't seem to understand tonight, especially in full gospel Pentecostal circles, they don't understand that this life is not about the surgery. This life is about preparing for surgery. 
uh, this life is indeed only a preparation for the day when our surgery or our transformation will take place. The surgery does not, it cannot take place here, but here we are merely, merely prepared for the day when our transformation shall be made complete. Amen. Isaiah 29, 16. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay. For shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not? Or shall the thing framed say of him that framed it, he had no understanding? How can we as human beings stand in the face of God and say, you don't know me, you don't understand me? Amen. How can we go to God and think the very one who made us, that he doesn't understand us and that he doesn't know us, how can we possibly think that as the clay we can speak to the potter and say, you made me wrong, you didn't do this right? Amen. Isaiah 64, 6 through 12. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. You see, all our righteousness. It didn't say all of our our self-righteousness, which would be righteousness that we think we're, you know, putting forth. But Isaiah said, all our righteousness, whether it be righteousness that you have indeed received from God or not, it still is a filthy rag before the Lord. As long as you're in this flesh and blood earthly existence, honey, you're still in need of surgery. You're still in need of a change. You still need something that goes beyond this existence. He said, And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is none that calleth upon thy name, that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us, and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. But now, O Lord, thou art our Father, we are the clay, and thou our potter, and we all are the work of thy hand. Oh, I wish churches today would understand that God's church is comprised of a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life. Their skin color may be different. Their vocation may be different. The amount of money they make may be different. Their gender may be different. Their sexual orientation may be different. But in the bottom line, the reality is that we're all the workmanship of the, of the potter's hand. Everybody has a right to come into the house of God, regardless of who they are. If they want to know God, they ought to have access to God. Amen. And there's not a one of us that ought to look. I don't care how you, much you think God made a mistake in you. You cannot look up toward Him and say, Lord, why did you make me this way? I'm second-guessing your creation in me. I think you made a mistake, Lord. How can the creation say to the Creator, you made a mistake? Amen. See, part of serving God, part of becoming a born-again child of God, in reality, a lot of churches don't tell you this, but it's learning to understand and accept your own humanity. Amen. See, too many want to make you like Jesus. Honey, if you could be made like Jesus that easily, I got news, it can't be done except for in the resurrection. That's why the Lord has slated it for the resurrection. That's why changeover day and transformation day is slated for the resurrection of the saints. If you could be like Jesus now, the Bible said Jesus Christ is the firstborn what? From the dead. So therefore to become what he was and is, you've got to go through what he did and you've got to die and experience the resurrection. But there are so many saints and so many churches that want to tell you 
that it's all about living up to a code. It's all about living up to rules and regulations. And, oh, there's this standard of holiness that you must live up to in order to be perfect before God and in order to be righteous before God. No, you've got to have faith. You've got to believe. You've got to obey the gospel. That's what you've got to do. That's all you've got to do. Amen. And then believe God that if He is true to His Word, and I believe He is, then in the end, when you close your eyes and sleep, it's like the anesthesiologist putting that mask over your face, because, honey, you're about to experience a surgery as the transformation is about to take place, and God is going to change you into something that is without spot or blemish, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We're just preparing for the surgery. We're just getting ready for the change. Hallelujah. We are tonight a work in progress. Hallelujah. Some want to say that others do not qualify for God's surgery day because of who they are or where they come from. They want to judge and condemn to death those they do not understand or approve of. For isn't ones being told that they do not qualify for life-saving surgery the same as being told that they are condemned to die? Amen. If you tell somebody, I'm sorry, but you don't qualify for a heart transplant, what you're really saying to them is you're condemned to die. Amen. When you tell people you don't qualify to come into the church of God, you don't qualify to be part of our fellowship. You don't qualify. What are you telling them? You're saying they're condemned to die. Amen. Jesus said, whosoever will, let him come. Whosoever will, let him come. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden. He didn't say all you that are rich and all you that are strong and all you that are straight and all you that are perfect and all you that are holy. No, he said, come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What did he say about his yoke? He said, for it is easy. Hallelujah. And you go to many churches tonight, and the yoke that they will lay upon you is not easy. Woo! you got to work your brains out to try to please God day to day. It's a chore. That's not what Jesus said. He said, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. Whoo, Connie, don't that make you happy to know that the, the yoke is easy, the burden is light that Jesus would have us to bear? Oh, children, listen. God understands his creation. The work of his own hands. We have no place to question our Maker as to why He made us one way or another, flawed and imperfect, or visibly flawless and beyond reproach. Regardless, we have no place to question the Creator. You see, He has purposes that we don't know of. The Bible said that He created the Pharaoh for the very purpose of glorifying Himself in resisting the release of the people of Israel from the land of Egypt. That's what the Bible actually tells us. It tells us that God specifically had Pharaoh in that place for that purpose. If he was going to glorify himself and make a fool out of the gods of Egypt through the plagues, because each plague that came upon Egypt was in direct uh, opposition to one of the gods of Egypt. They worshiped the sun god, so the Lord said, I'll make it dark. I'll show you who's the sun god. I'll show you who's really in charge of the sun. They had a little frog god. He said, I'll give you frogs. You want frogs? I'll show you who's in charge of frogs. They worship the God of the Nile. He said, you want to worship the God of the Nile? I'll turn the water to blood, and I'll show you who's the God of the Nile. But for him, 
to glorify himself in the land of Egypt. He needed a hard-hearted Pharaoh who would stand against the will of God. He needed that. He had to have that. So he put him there for that very purpose. So if God made you less than perfect in your own eyes, if God made you a little flawed, if he made you a little bit, you know, not quite right, the world don't think everything with you is just right, or your family don't think everything with you is just right, honey, learn to accept it and embrace it. Come on now, and trust God for your salvation. Quit leaning on what you can be, and worry, uh, excuse me, and lean on what Jesus was. Amen. See, I don't lean on my own perfection because, girl, I'll tell you what. Oh, if there's been a week in my life when my perfection was tested, this last week was it, and I failed with flying colors. Oh, I mean, it was a tough week. It was a tough week. And my humanity came out all over the place, just spilled out all over. But you know what I'm glad for? I'm glad that I'm just preparing for surgery. I'm glad that I'm a work in progress. I'm glad that God doesn't expect me to operate on myself and make myself perfect. Because it can't be done. But rather I'm glad that he understands as long as I'm in this existence... Paul said, the things that I would do, I don't do. And the things that I wouldn't do, I do. He said, there's a battle going on in me every day, all day. The spirit wrestles with the flesh, and the flesh wrestles against the spirit. He said, this is the nature of our human existence. Oh, but praise God, we're a work in progress. Romans 9, uh, 18 through 21. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will be, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to, the, to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? If you remember some weeks ago, I preached about the fact that we're all part and parcel of God's sacred structure that he is building the holy temple under the Lord, and each one of us as individuals is part of that structure. Each one of us cannot occupy the same position. Each one of us cannot be in the same place. Each one of us cannot look exactly alike. It, you just can't do it, because if you did, you'd have a flagpole. It's the same at the bottom as it is at the top. But how are you going to build a, a tabernacle under the Lord if, you know, and, and everything's the same if you got all two-by-fours and you don't have any windows or if you have all windows and you don't have any two-by-fours or you don't have any sheetrock or you don't have any plaster or you don't have any brick or you don't have any shingles or if you don't have any commodes or if you don't have any sinks or if you don't have any plumbing well sure the commodes and the sinks and all are not as pretty as the stained glass windows but they're all part of the structure and God said Paul saying here, he said, how can the thing that is formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me thus? Well, Lord, I'd love to be pastoring tonight a church with, oh, a thousand people. No, I wouldn't. Honestly, I wouldn't. I, I, I'd be happy with 200 maybe, but... But instead, Lord, why am I just here with a few people tonight? But you know what? Why would the one who's formed question the one who formed him? He told me what to do. He told me what my job is. You know what my job is? My job's to preach the gospel, to feed the flock of God, to do for, if, if, if I only do for the very few that ever come through this door, then that's who I'm supposed to do for. And I can't second guess God. Amen. That's part of this walk. That's part of this 
Christianity we talk about is learning to accept our station in life, learning to accept what God has made us and how God has made us. I look forward to a day when I won't be what I am today, a quick-tempered, sometimes rather dopey, I don't know, I could go into a great big list of things that I am that aren't so great. I won't. But you know, Paul gave us a wonderful promise in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 57. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, I'm just tonight a work in progress. Amen. I'm just, I'm just a work in progress. No, as the old song says, I'm not perfect, just forgiven. Hadn't yet arrived, but I'm on my way. Since Jesus found me and forgave me, I cannot say I'm perfect, but I can say I'm saved. Amen. Because I believed and obeyed the gospel, and I lived my life with a fear of God in my heart, not afraid of God. That's not what fear of God means. But that means you give God a prominent place in your thinking and in your living. Amen. I love what David the psalmist wrote in Psalm 17, 15. I honestly believe this is the most beautiful scripture verse in the entire Bible. And if it should ever come to it and you have the opportunity to create a tombstone that will serve to mark my last and final resting place, I would love for this verse to be written on it. Probably cost you a fortune, but... It's only, it's not that long a verse, but you know, tombstones are expensive to chisel. And it says simply, as for me, David said, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be just uh, satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Hallelujah. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. CMJ, I'm probably never in this lifetime going to be thrilled with myself. <laughs> it may never happen. I may. You know, I may get to the point in my life where I'm happy with myself because I don't lose my temper as much or I don't get as upset as much or I don't do as many dumb things. But I know this much. As David said, I know one thing. I said, I'm going to see Jesus face to face in righteousness. And although I may never be satisfied in this life, I will be satisfied. I will. Isn't it wonderful when you can say that you know the day's going to come when you're going to be satisfied? I will be satisfied. You want to know when? When I be when I awake. In thy likeness. When I come out of that surgery, having been changed, amen. When the spirit of death has come in as an anesthesiologist that put me to sleep, and then the spirit of God comes in as a surgeon and resurrects me into a completely new creation, amen. I'll be satisfied then. I'll be satisfied then. 
in the meantime, Mother, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm doing everything in my power to make sure that I'm ready for the surgery. Amen. I just want to be ready for the surgery. I want to, I, when the time comes, I want God to be able to perform that operation in me. I know what's required, and I am going to do everything in my power to see to it that I'm ready. Amen. I'm going to steal one of these real quick because I've had a bit of a sore throat. Amen. Well, I, I realize tonight this has been a very simple word of exhortation, but uh, we kind of wanted to keep the service fairly short. Actually, I'm right on time. For, for all the yakking I did, we're right on time. And uh, I'm grateful for everyone that's here. We miss Curry tonight. We miss Jose. We miss um, the Abbot, yeah, Scott, and Curtis, and Crystal, and all these various ones. And there's this other lady whose name I'm wanting to forget. Sh Shirley, that's right, Shirley. And, uh, and then we have more yet that, that go back to our former meeting place. And we're still trying to get them to come back in. And, you know, I'll tell you what, this preacher... It's not the, uh, I'm not a hard preacher. I'm not, you know, I'm not a strict preacher, so to speak. I don't preach a lot of rules and regulations. I preach faith. The only thing going to get you into heaven is faith. You can follow all the rules and regulations you want to and still split hell wide open. So the only thing going to get you in the pearly gates is faith. And, uh, but it's funny how that there are so many who even though our message is as positive as it is, and, and, and it has a, a very positive nature and a positive tone, they still don't much care for my preaching because I tend to be too straightforward about certain things, like we were talking earlier about some of these TV preachers and things, you know. And that offends them. Because they don't, you know, I, I shouldn't say anything about them. I shouldn't say anything about well, maybe you shouldn't say anything about them. If God hadn't called you to say anything, then keep your mouth shut. Amen. If God hadn't called you to say anything, then you just keep your little mouth quiet. But I'll tell you, when God called me to preach at the age of eight years old, he told me I would have a prophetic ministry. He also told me there were times I was going to say things that were going to curl people's hair. He said, and the reason you're going to say it is because I'm going to put it in you to say. I'm going to tell you to say it. And when I tell you to say it, I want you to say it. He said, and I don't care what their reaction is, you say it. And I've been doing that now for nigh on 20 years. Some folks can take it and others cannot. You know, Jesus had those who followed him until he said things that were just too hard for them to hear. And all of a sudden they walked away. He turned to his disciples and said, well, will you also walk away? And they said, Lord, where would we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. You know, I find in any church I've pastored in the last 20 years that we usually grow. We always grow. We always wind up with a good group of people. But you know what? We get some of the most sincere, greatest people you ever want to meet. 